Rahim, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasul al Kareem wa ala ahli sahab ajma'in. We're going to begin this next session, which is called Sharing Perspectives, Stories of Perseverance. And this session describes individuals whose success comes from placing Islamic values at the heart of their stories. Through personal accounts of struggle, failure, and success, these speakers will instruct attendees on how to enrich physical, mental, and social well-being through spiritual enlightenment. Additionally, this session will advise us on how to endure the challenges in our lives to improve our personal tales and narratives. We have four esteemed guests for this session. I'm going to read very brief bios. Their complete bios are in your books. Najah Bazi is a transcultural nurse, clinical specialist, and a diversity specialist with 32 years spent in the area of transcultural healthcare. She's a CEO of Diversity Specialists and Transcultural Healthcare Solutions and is also the executive director and founder of Zaman International, a humanitarian nonprofit organization that provides crucial services to many in the Detroit metropolitan area. Abdul Nasser Jenga was born and raised in Dallas, Texas, and is the director and founder of Al Qalam Institute. At the age of 10, he began the road to learning the Quran, and along with Alim courses, he also got his BA and MA in Arabic. And he is an Imam, serves as an instructor and curriculum advisor to various Islamic institutions, including Bayina Institute. Rais Bouillon is an ordinary man with an extraordinary story. Just weeks after the terrorist attacks of September 11th, a masked man stormed into the Dallas convenience store where he worked and asked him where he was from and then shot him in the face at point blank range. And you'll hear the rest of his story, inshallah. And then last but not least is Muhammad Sultan, who is an Egyptian-American activist who took part in the Rabah sit-in, got shot, was later arrested, and then spent the next 19 months in jail, 16 months of which he was on a hunger strike. So we're going to start first with their sister Najah Bazi. Everyone please give a round of applause for sister Najah. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. As-salatu as salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon each and every one of you, upon our holy prophet, his holy family, his righteous companions. So I get to go first, and you know what they say, you save the best for last, which automatically tells you that the first isn't going to be as good as the last. So we're supposed to talk about our story, our struggle, and then some kind of tricks of the trade, and um, some of the things that inspire us and keep us motivated and keep us going. I I'm really not one to talk about my story. I'd much rather listen to your story than to speak of my story. But because the paragraph is asking us to do this, I'm going to venture out a little bit into my own personal life. Even though in Muhammad legacy of a prophet, you pretty much were all in my kitchen. But nonetheless, that's a little different. So I think that what I want to really lead with in the next few minutes is this idea of what I call pathfinding. What is your purpose? What is my purpose? What is it that we're supposed to be doing? What is it that we think about late at night when our head is down on the pillow and wondering whether or not we've been good today? What is it that drives us on a day-to-day -day basis to do good, to be good, to say on Sirat al-Mustaqim? What is it that makes you, you know, give you that extra oomph, that extra desire to want to serve? So I will admit that it's been a journey, and I will admit that I'm a very, very busy person. I think I'm probably the busiest person that I know, but I think I'm also one of the calmest people that I know in this world of busyness, and that's because I'm able to shut out the noise, focus on what needs to be done, and also I have learned through leaders and through other mentors how to stay in my lane. And that's one of the most important things, is how do you stay in your lane? Let me give you an example so you understand what I'm talking about. And this is what pathfinding is. I teach this, especially to executives across country and around the world. And I teach it 
especially to young people, so that they're able to always know what they should do. The story goes like this. When I was four years old, my grandmother lived with us. May God give her peace. And she always cooked. And I come from the Detroit area, so one of the first massages was built in an area that was called Dix Avenue. And my grandmother was kind of a matriarch of that particular masjid. So she would cook in the early years. We're talking 1960s, 63, 64. I remember I was four years old at the time. And she would make massive amounts of food. And I was at her knee for 300, 400, 500 people. Because I loved her and because I loved being with her and under her watchful eye, I learned to cook. And I could actually whip up dinner for 100 people and probably a good hour and a half, two hours, I could get it done. That's because of her training. But what that done, that feeding people, as I continue to grow, I have a brother who has muscular dystrophy. He's unable to lift a finger. I've spoken about him at ISNA before. He's unable to move anything which required that we feed him. And it takes a lot of time to feed him. Breakfast, lunch, dinner sometimes up to two hours at a time per meal. So when I was 10 years old or so, I started feeding my brother. And then as I got a little bit older, and I started to take care of more and more things in my life, I ended up going into nursing. And what do you do as a nurse? You take care of people and you feed them. So it wouldn't be unlikely for me to be feeding a patient or helping them out. And then again and again, the same pattern repeated itself. And in my nursing career, I, find, I found myself doing humanitarian work, which is now in 12 countries, taking care of marginalized women with children, abandoned, abused, divorced, widowed, living under $12,000 a year. And what am I doing? I'm feeding clothing, shelter. What's my point? My point is, is that in every single human being, because God is not an aimless God, God creates with purpose. Every single one of you and myself and the folks behind me are all created with the purpose that we're supposed to fulfill. I will never get away from feeding people. The reason why I will not is because it's been a pattern in my life. To try to push that out of my life isn't going to work because it's going to resurface. So it's an issue of understanding what one of your many purposes are and then following that passion and working that passion into your life and identifying the pattern. But one day in Medina, what happened was, you know, like all of you who go to Hajj, I was in the Rauda, and I was just crying, 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 begging God, just begging Allah, make me your servant. And then it occurred to me that I was making a dua for many, many years that I needed to tweak. And that dua was what I wanted to be, not what God wanted me to be. So in the Rauda, I made a very special dua. I repeated it on the wall of, of, of the Kaaba. Allah, make me what you want me to be, not what it is that I want to be, because certainly you would know best. I make that dua daily. So that's one of the tips I'd like to give you. Make that daily dua, make it intentional, and let God schedule you. He's the best schedule and the best planner. The other tip that I have that's helped me tremendously is priorities. And I never, never change the priority or the order. It's not easy, but it's God first, family next, and then everything else will fall into place. So if it means during the day that I have to switch something up and I could be in an executive meeting at the highest level, Something happens with the family, I excuse myself, I put something else in place, and I'll take care of the issue at hand. The reason why I feel so strongly about that is because I believe for me, maybe not for you, that the pecking order of responsibility is Allah first, my family next, and then everything else. 
Believe it or not, because he's my scheduler, I get more done than I could have ever gotten done. The third tip is stay in wudu. Stay in wudu. And that's something I've been wanting to say. Because oftentimes, we're not ready for that moment of death, but we should be. Because death is just a breath away. Have you ever taken two breaths at one time? No. So because we breathe one breath at a time, we want to make sure that every breath counts. Stay in the remembrance of Allah, dhikr. Always talk to God. Take him as your best friend, as someone who you are in love with in a very special way. It's okay to smile and to talk to him when you're driving your car and to focus yourself and to remember that dhikr just doesn't have to be at the time of salah. Dhikr is something in God consciousness and taqwa that's all day. The other thing that I do, and this may seem scary, but remember, I'm a nurse and I do a lot of end of life work, so end of life is a reality for me. I'm very aware of the end of life. I also do ghusl al-mayyit, the washing of the dead. So that's a constant reminder to me that, you know, there is a finality to this, and it's up to me to advocate for myself. It's up to, for, to me to do my own good deeds, to be my own best advocate. So I say shahadat al every night before I go to sleep. Now, some people think that's morbid. I don't think it's morbid. I think that it's relaxing to say the declaration every single night before I put my head to sleep. To, to remember Allah, to say that Islam is my deen, that Quran is my kitab, that the Kaaba is my qibla, that the Rasul is my Rasul. I remember myself with that and I put myself to sleep with that every night. So the reason why I say to stay on wudu is because there's something about that calmness, there's something about that readiness that begins to affect your nafs. And it begins to affect who you are and how you are and what you are. So these are just some of the tips that I have taught myself and that I wish to teach others I'm by no means perfect. Every day you're a student in the world. Every day you deal with struggles. You laugh, you cry, you struggle, you beg God for help. But one last parting advice. Because I have a humanitarian organization and because I'm always needing to raise funds and things like that, I've learned to ask this way and not this way. And if I ask this way, he sends things this way. So I thank you for your time. My time is up. I hope you enjoy the rest of your Isna evening and you all get home safely. Wassalamu alaikum, inshallah, we see you next year. Jazakallah khair, Sister Najah. Next we will hear from Muhammad Sultan, whose story has been heard and has resounded around the world. Welcome to the podium. Assalamu alaikum. So I didn't, um, I didn't know which story I wanted to share with you today. So I decided that I'm going to share something for the first time. Because I was, it was the one thing that I was always scared of. It's something that I consciously suppressed for the last two years. And I share it with you today because I feel like I'm home, alhamdulillah. I feel comfortable enough to share it with you. So I'm going to read it to you. This is something that I wrote on the anniversary of Rab'ah this last year. For two years, I consciously suppressed every image I captured in my own head of that fatal Rab'ah day. I tried to forget every body, every bullet, every wound. 
I try to forget the hopeless feeling of dead men walking, running from death to death. I try to forget the familiar faces of Egypt's finest youth, Habiba, Asma, Mus'ab, Ahmed, and hundreds more. I tried forgetting the feeling of watching two cameramen atop the Rab'a stage take bullets to their head. I tried forgetting their blood on the white Rab'a banner that read the revolution slogan, Silmiya. I tried forgetting the feeling I had after the sniper's bullet missed my head by inches. I tried to forget the feeling of getting shot seconds later. I tried forgetting the feeling of guilt I was that I was taking up the time and effort of the doctors in the makeshift hospital, in the makeshift hospital for a minor bullet wound when there were so many others that were critically injured. I tried forgetting. I tried forgetting the pain I walked around with after getting the wound stitched up. I tried forgetting the sound of bullets for 11 straight hours. I tried forgetting laying on the floor unable to move, feeling debilitated, hopeless, helpless, wishing that the bullet that had just missed my head would end the misery that I was in. I tried forgetting about going back to the hospital hours later to try to take refuge in a place that's supposed to have some sanctity. I tried forgetting the feeling of suffocation as a ton of people like me got shoved into the hospital. I tried forgetting the broken smile on little Ali's face as he sat next to me on his injured dad's lap. I tried forgetting how Ali's dad twisted his arm and was moving the makeshift fan to give me some air while he was trying to give air to his suffocating son. I tried forgetting drifting in and out of consciousness as tear gas was being shot inside the already crowded room. I tried forgetting being in excruciating pain and suffocating at the same time. I tried forgetting the guilt trip, I, the guilt tripping thought that still haunts me to this day that my pain was nowhere near what others with critical injuries must have felt. I tried forgetting being told that a safe exit was negotiated 10 hours later, but that everyone was on his own. You couldn't lean on anybody. If you were injured and you couldn't walk, you couldn't get out. I tried forgetting. I tried forgetting how I felt walking out during that first safe exit, ducking because the bullets were flying over our heads as we walked through a row between officers that were shooting at us. Seeing the images later, it seemed so intentional that it would be caught on camera with us leaving Rab'a with our heads down. I tried forgetting the fear on the elder man's face walking a few steps ahead of me as an officer ran up to him sticking his gun in his head and saying, we are doing this for the sake of Allah, you hypocrites after the elder man had just said, Hasbi Allahu wa ni'm al -wakil. I tried forgetting walking down the streets of Medinat Nasr like a zombie, feeling nothing and everything all at once. I tried forgetting watching the videos recovered a few days later of that same building, that same makeshift hospital that I was at being set on fire by the same officers that escorted us out, I tried forgetting. But what I couldn't forget was the thought of, and the feeling of the pain of those injured people. What must have felt 
right before they got burnt alive, 10 times the pain I was in. They were, ten, they were in 10 times the pain I was in, suffocating from the tear gas and then feeling and getting burnt to death. Nobody, nobody on this earth deserves to feel that much pain. See, during my detention, I saw those same memories in the eyes of a central security officer that was escorting me during one of the hearings. It was clear that guilt had made him, had made him lose sleep and the prayer bead in his shaking hand said it all. He was well aware of the innocent lives he had taken. He knew. I smiled. Not because of anything other than the fact that I just was not ready to relive those memories. I was not ready to remember how it felt to be on the receiving end. The officer put his head down just like I did on my way out of Rabah. I went back to prison and he went home to his family. For the rest of the two years, I tried to forget but the memories of that nightmare still haunt me until this day. Wallahi, I tried to suppress. It's the one thing that I tried to suppress. It's the one thing that I didn't own, that I didn't stare in its face and try to challenge it. I couldn't. It was too much blood. I tried to suppress and forget. But today, I'm forced to remember because the world seems to have forgotten the bloody, what happened on the bloodiest day in, Egypt, in Egypt's modern history. Where the world watched innocent women, men, and children get killed and nothing was done. Nothing was done for those people until today. That's as much as I can remember from that day of Rabah, that fatal day. So many things happened after that. So many things. And as I look back on it and reflect, reflect on my time in prison, reflect on the times that I felt hopeless, times I almost gave up, times I wanted to break my strike, times that I wanted to escalate my strike so that I can just be at peace. But I didn't. It's not because of anything. Other than the fact that I knew that there were good people out there fighting for this cause. That there was good people out there doing things out of the goodness of their heart. That good people still exist. That you as a community mobilized. That you did something, you engaged, you added pressure, and you had one little success story called Muhammad Sultan. So I beg of you, please, if we know that engaging works, if we know that if we engage in the system it works, why do we only mobilize when it's a life or death situation? Why would it take Somebody almost dying nine times. Why can't we take preventative measures? Why can't we engage in the system regularly so that we can prevent these tragedies from happening? What you guys did, what, what you had persevered, what you were patient with, with my struggle, with all the ups and downs, wallahi, it's what made me continue. You never lost hope, so I couldn't lose hope so long as you weren't losing it. So please, when you're listening to these stories, try to take something back, an action item. What can I do? Every single one of you guys can do something. Every tweet, every post, every dua, every time you spoke to somebody about an injustice anywhere, you were doing something, you were adding something. But we have to understand 
this idea of, of tawakkul ala Allah, to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we understand this, wallahi, things will be so much easier. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Anfal, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى it's, you did not throw when you threw, but Allah threw. You're like, what? what? What's going on? How does that make sense? So you have to go through the motions. But the motions of throwing, of doing what you have to do, exhausting all worldly means. But the result, what makes it hit the target is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So... The epitome of tawakkul, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and I will conclude with this. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in preparation for the battle of Badr, that he took all worldly means. He exhausted all worldly means as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not going to help him at all. That he was only relying on these means. But then when he was done preparing, he prayed and made dua like he has not prepared at all. He prayed desperately like he had not prepared at all. This is tawakkul. So throughout this process of my own ordeal, you guys have shown perseverance that you never gave up. You kept doing work, you tried one thing after another, one thing after another, one thing after another, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so kind and merciful to bring all of those efforts together. Alhamdulillah, grant me my freedom. Honestly, I did not think I was going to come out. I, I almost died nine times. So it's your perseverance that's so inspiring. So I thank you. But I want every single one of you to know that wallahi, you can do something. You can make a change. All you have to do is put in the effort and make dua. Because our struggle with injustices, our struggle for freedom is ongoing. Inshallah, when Syria, when Egypt, when Iraq, when Yemen, when Libya, when these countries are free, they will, we will have other struggles. It's an ongoing struggle. We just have to put in our effort to the best of their, our abilities and raise our hands to the sky and say, Ya Allah, please grant us victory. Ya Allah, please accept from us. Jazakumullahu khayran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, brother Muhammad and... May Allah hear your words and your pleas and your du'as. The du'a of a Muslim person is mustajab. And inshallah, if not today, if not tomorrow, in the future, all of these lands where Muslims are being oppressed and killed and persecuted and suffering the way he's described will be free. I want to um, show you a very brief video before I call Brother Rais to the podium to tell his story. So let's see the video, inshallah. She spent kind of a year and a half looking for some sort of story to tell about the American dream and what was happening to it. This story scrambles everything you think. One of them is a, an immigrant from Bangladesh who comes to America wanting to get in on the IT revolution. The other is a, a product of a kind of ailing white working class in Texas. The gunman came to this door pointing a gun directly at my face and I begged him not to shoot me and I realized that he is not here for money. I did what I thought I had to do. I did what every other American wanted to do, but he didn't have the nerve. Shoots him point blank range. It was very hard to argue that he had a chance to be much different than what he became. Abuse from the youngest, uh, youngest days. Wrestled with meth and wrestled with being in and out of prison. This man is scheduled to be executed in Texas. In his final days, his victim has been fighting to save his life. I didn't want him to die. I looked at him as a human being like me. His execution will not eradicate hate crimes from this world. 
we will simply lose a human life without dealing with that root cause. He got an exposure to another America, and he didn't like the fact that there was this undernation of hurting people beneath the fortunate country he had accessed. And he decides that publicly forgiving this man and then fighting to save his life would not only be the right thing for that man and for him, uh, but would invite a dialogue in this country about the power of mercy mm. instead of revenge. Once he found peace, forgiveness, compassion from the person whom he tried to kill, he became a changed person. My split second of hate and anger after 9-11 has caused many people lifetimes of pain, and I regret that. One was just this story of attempted murder and forgiveness, but beneath that was really a story of these two Americas, a thriving one and a failing one, which kind of often stay apart, but brutally collided in this story. It was the Muslim immigrant from the third world who actually was able to access the America that still worked, because after being shot, he rebuilt his life in this extraordinary way. And it was the Texan born in America who actually, when you dug into it, belonged to an America that stopped working a long time ago. It's the Muslim man who's seeking mercy, and the Muslim man who argues that the Quran compels him to the belief that taking a life is like taking all lives, and saving one life is like saving all mankind. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Sister Amina Jindali, for the kind interaction. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here. You had the option to be somewhere else, but you chose to be here, so thank you. Thanks to Isna for inviting me to talk about the transformational power of forgiveness from my personal experience. And I'm honored. 14 years back, a human being in Dallas, Texas, treated me as a lesser person. He tried to kill me simply because of my physical appearance. And I responded as my parents and Islam had taught me with love and forgiveness. These are the core values of Islam, but also of Christianity, Judaism, and many other religions in this world. This response of mercy and forgiveness did not prevent profound sufferings but it did create a space for many other blessings showered on many other people. I'm here to suggest that forgiveness benefits everybody. Before I share you my story, let me first explain that I was born and raised in an upper middle class family in Bangladesh. And I was very lucky to have a first rate education at a military boarding school and later on at the Air Force Academy where I learned to be a pilot. But after graduating as a pilot officer, I did not feel my destiny was there. And I would get, when I got a chance to go to US for higher education, I took it. So temporarily, I left my family and my fiance back home to go to US to get the education I wanted to and to experience the American dream. But within a short time, my American dream turned into American nightmare. It was September 21st, 2001, 10 days after September 11 terrorist attack. I was working in a gas station in Dallas, Texas. Suddenly, a man burst in, wearing bandana, sunglasses, baseball cap, and he had a double barrel shotgun that he pointed directly at my face. I immediately opened the cash register and offered him the money and begged him for my life. He was not looking at it though, he was looking at me. And then he mumbled a question, where are you from? And before I could say anything more than excuse me, he shot me from four feet away with a double barrel shotgun in the right side of my face, in the right side of my head. I felt it first, like a million bees stinging my face, and then I heard the sound like an explosion. After the gunman left the store, I ran to the barbershop next door, and three men inside looked at me in horror, scrambling to escape out back, and I screamed, grabbing one of them, please call 911, I'm dying, I wanna die today, please help me. The ambulance worker found me running around screaming in the parking lot, 
And on my way to the hospital, my eyes were getting closed, my brains were shutting down. And at that time, images of my mother, my father, my other siblings, and my fiance appeared before my eyes and then a graveyard. I felt my time was up. And at any moment, outlive this world. My mouth was moving like a machine. I was reciting verses from the Holy Quran and I was begging God not to take me. And I promised Allah that if you let me live, I promise I would do good things with my life. Long story short, I didn't die. But the hospital, which was private and expensive, and I didn't have any health insurance, they discharged me the next day by noon and asked me to, f to arrange my follow-up medical treatments. The second part of my American nightmare just began. Finally, it was discovered the man with the gun had been Mark Stroman, a white supremacist in Dallas, Texas, who was in a shooting rampage to kill as many Muslims as possible as a retaliation of 9-11 terrorist attack. He claimed he was hunting for Arabs. But not a one of the three men he shot and killed two of them were Arab. And he claimed after he was arrested that what he did, most Americans wanted to do, but didn't have the girls. He said he's a true, he's a patriot, he's a true American. He should be given medal for his action. He was tried and convicted, and he was given death penalty by lethal injection in April 2002. So, I'm sharing this story not because I survived, but because I learned something from this very negative experience that I would like to share. It may sound unbelievable that I gained more from this experience than I've lost. So let me tell you first what I have lost. I lost a vision in one eye. If his aim was a little better, I would have blind in both eyes. I had a better than perfect vision, more 20 by 10. I lost a tooth, which was thankfully replaced. I lost home. As I could no longer work and pay rent, I was thrown out. When my father heard me what had happened to me, he suffered a stroke, but thanks to Allah that he survived. Not only that, my medical bills are piling up. It went up to $60,000, six zero. And I didn't know what to do with that. And I reached out to Red Cross for help. But after several weeks of back and forth email, phone call, Red Cross finally told me I qualified for one week's worth of groceries. I lost my security. If one person wanted me dead, might there be others? I didn't dare going outside for a while and kept looking over my shoulder when I did. From this extra report, From this extra report, you can see that my face was peppered with bullet fragments, which had dug themselves into my skull. And I'm still carrying more than 35 pillars on my face under the skin. When I touch my face, it's all bumpy. Not only that, I lost my fiance. My doctor advised me not to fly until all the surgeries were over, so I could not go back home. And my fiance wasn't sure if I would be able to come back home. So she moved on and married somebody else. This is a long list, and I don't want to bore you by telling all the pain and suffering I went through. I, lost, I had lost a great deal, but I did not give up. I did not lose my faith in Allah. I never questioned Allah why all these bad things happened to me. Rather, I ask Allah, give me the strength to go through these difficulties. I believed there was a reason why Allah saved my life and then put me through all these pain and sufferings one after another one. In my childhood, my parents taught me that 
Allah does not place any burden on a soul that it cannot bear. La yukallifullahu nafsan illa ghusaha, Surah Al-Baqarah, verses 286. And also, verily with every difficulty, there is relief, Surah Al-Inshira, verses 5 to 6. At the beginning, it seems to me that I cannot bear that. I could not go through that. It's too much to carry on. But I remembered those verses, and I prayed every single day for Allah's mercy and Allah's help. And that was the strength I got from these verses that helped me to stay calm, do the next right thing. And eventually, the relief started coming from Allah, one after another one. A friend took me in, so I had a place to live. A Christian doctor performed eye surgeries before he had any assurance how he would be paid. A Muslim man named Muhammad Hassan from Richardson, Texas Mosque gave me a scholarship to attend school. And as a result of that education, I was able to get a good job in IT. So with the mercy of Allah and with the help of good people, I was eventually able to get my life back on track so that I could go for a Hajj in 2009 along with my mother. And it was, in the, it was during the Hajj that I deeply realized that, that hate and revenge may bring temporary satisfaction, but they never bring peace or lasting solution to any situation. They only bring more disaster and misery. It was there I also thought about my shooter, Mark Stroman, who was sitting in a death row waiting to die. And I realized that by killing him, we would simply lose a human life without dealing with the root cause. I suffered terribly, and I did not see any value in him suffering as well. Instead of hating him, I saw him as a human, human being like myself. And I thought, if he was given a chance to live, even behind bar, he might become a better person. And I remembered the promise I made to Allah in the first few minutes after I was shot, that if you let me live, I would do good things with my life. I came back from the Hajj as a changed person and he started lobby to the same of the life of my attacker, Mark Stroman. Thanks to Muslim Legal Fund of America, Amnesty International, and several other local and national organizations for their great support. Special thanks to Reprieve. It's a London-based organization helping to take my campaign to the European Union Parliament, German Parliament, at the headquarters of Lundbeck, the lethal injection manufacturer in Denmark, where I was able to convince them to write a letter to the governor of Texas, Rick Perry, and to request him not to use their product to kill a human being, and they did it. Not only that, I also went to the U.S. Supreme Court asking for clemency for my attacker. Despite all these efforts, Mark Stroman was executed July 2011. But before he was executed, he came to know a little bit about me, a man he had tried to kill. When he heard that I formed a coalition of Muslims, Jews, Christians, Hindus, atheists, people from all walks of life to get him removed from the death row, he was reduced to tears. He could not believe that. That's not something he expected from the Muslims. At the end of his life, he condemned his own acts of violence thanked the entire Muslim community and called me brother, and he said he loved me in a phone conversation. At his execution, his last words were, hate is going on everywhere, it has to stop. Hate causes a lifetime of pain. Let me show you a video of Mark Sturman before he was executed. Ah. Mr. Reyes, thank you for your, your inspiring act of, of compassion towards me. You have forgiven me. You have forgiven the unforgivable. And I have a lot of love and 
respect for you. For the Patels, the Hassans, thank you all for what you all have done. Uh, the question is, if I don't make it, what do I want you to carry on? Man, just what you're doing today is, is remarkable. To, you know, to, to get out there and take center stage and try to get the world put the world to rights you know that's that's a remarkable thing you're doing and just continue with the human rights movement because you are touching so many people i've been getting so many so many letters and messages from all over the world that you mr reyes are inspiring them and that right there strengthens me so dude just rock on thank you for giving me Allah says in Surah Al-Hamim, in verses 34, When people are mean, be nice back to them. What will happen? In the next line, Allah says again, The person who is your worst enemy will become your best friend. And that's what happened in this case. I now and president of an organization that I founded in 2011 called World Without Hate. And we believe in the transformational power of forgiveness. I have received several Peace and Justice Award locally and nationally, including the title 2011 Americans of the Year, along with Steve Jobs, Warren Buffett, and many other people. And besides working in IT full-time as a systems manager, I travel all over the world to preach the value of forgiveness and to end the cycle of hate and violence. Last year, a New York Times writer named Anand Dardash wrote a book on my story entitled The True American. And within a week, when the book came out, within a week, Hollywood picked up this story to make a feature film. So at the end of my speech, I would like to tell you this, that every single challenges we go through in our life is nothing but a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the master planner. He is in charge of every single thing that happens in our life. And in times of difficulties, we must increase our effort to get closer to Allah. And remember, the harder is the test, the sweeter is the reward. Thank you. Thank you. Zakalah Khair for sharing that incredible story of courage and resilience and perseverance. And now last but not least, Sheikh Abdul Nasser Jangda is going to share a few thoughts and close the session for us, inshallah. Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Y'all today... Uh, here in this session, I've heard some remarkable stories of the human spirit, of faith, of belief. Um, I don't say this as, you know, in, in, the, in the sense of false humility, that I really do not have anything to share with you, anything that is near that uh, powerful, uh, very frankly speaking. Uh, but nevertheless, I was asked to speak here what I would like to share with you from a personal perspective is a story, a personal story that I have that demonstrates what inspired me to really dedicate myself to helping people discover their spiritual capacity and their spiritual potential. 
an, an experience and an interaction that I had as a very young child that showed me just the good within every human being and the potential for anyone and everyone, primarily, specifically the ones that you least expect of what they can do and what they're capable of was a really interesting and remarkable experience. I'll give you a shorter version that basically when I was about five years old, I have a younger sister, she was a year old at the time. My, mo my mother was in a really, really bad accident uh, where her arm was just completely shattered. Uh, they had to perform about a half a dozen surgeries to give her some type of the use of her arm back. And it was a really tough moment. You know, we were just trying to get by. My dad was a graduate student trying to make it through, uh, working, you know, two, three jobs. Now you had all these medical bills that were compounding. Um, and my mother was not, so it's not like my father could take care of us. My mother was in no condition to take care of anyone. Let her, she couldn't take care of herself, let alone us. We didn't have any family. This is back in the early 80s where the Dallas community was so young that we didn't even have a very large community. There were maybe eight Muslim families in all of Dallas. So we come home from the hospital after spending a week in the hospital, basically as a family. We come home and there was an elderly Texan, you know, typical type of couple, an elderly retired couple that lived in the apartment right in front of us. And the, the lady, the elderly lady, her name was Betty. She came over and she asked, you know, what happened? And we had never spoken to her much. I'm not proud of that fact. It's just immigrant mentality where you just kind of, you're even afraid of your own shadow for a while. So we hadn't spoken to her much. She came over and she said, what happened? And we told her what had transpired. My dad filled her in. And she said, you know, you're going to need a lot of help. If you don't mind, I'd like to help. I ain't got nothing else to do. I have one kid grown up off on their own. So I'd like to help out. You know, we were in no position to dictate what we could do and couldn't do. So we said, sure. Now this elderly Christian Texan woman started coming over to our house in the morning. She would get me ready for school. She would take care of my younger sister. She would look after my mom. She would cook the food, clean the apartment. She would do everything. And we were not paying her. There was no exchange. There was nothing. She was just doing it. And it got to the point where this went on for weeks, eventually months. And you know how children are? We got so attached to her, to Betty, she was our aunt at that point. We got so attached to her that we would try to follow her into her own apartment. Because it was right across the hallway. And she didn't want us coming in her apartment because she was like, I don't know, your parents might not be comfortable with you coming in my apartment. So she came and she asked my mom what, because we would just, you know how kids are, we would stand there and we'd cry. So she asked my mom what needed to happen in order for us to be able to go into our apartment. My mom just said, you know, there's not a lot, but just no beer, alcohol. Like, I don't want my kids around that stuff. So she said, okay. So she said, bringing no more pork into the house. And her husband, whose name was Larry, he was an old truck driver. So he used to drink a lot. And um, she told him, she said, Larry, no more beer in the house. And, you know, being like an old, angry Texan truck driver, he was kind of like, what woman, I'm gonna drink beer in my house. And Betty had this look that she just gave Larry that look. And at just a couple of minutes of that look, Larry's like, okay, fine, I'm gonna go drink in my truck. And I still remember till this day playing outside as a little kid and I could see Larry sitting in his truck drinking, looking at me and he hated me so much. Stupid brown kid, right? He hated me so much. But Betty took care of us. She was like family. And from that point on forward, Betty was my mom's older sister. She was my aunt. Alhamdulillah, my mom actually biological, like sisters, siblings, 
My mom had, many of them have passed away now, my mom had eight sisters. But I never knew none of them. They were all in Pakistan. I was born and raised in Dallas. Betty was more of my khala, more of my aunts than any of my actual aunts were. And I saw the goodness of just the soul. And I also learned a lesson from my parents that my parents did not have this hyper overreaction to a non-Muslim as if they're just like nudges and they shouldn't be around you and you don't interact with them. And Betty was like family and she remained like family for the next 25 years until about 12 years ago, Betty was diagnosed with cancer. It was in the very late stages. And my mom basically spent the last couple of weeks of Betty's life sitting next to her bed. And the day before Betty passed away, holding my mom's hand, she read the Shahada, she read the Kalima. And I learned from that experience the value of every soul in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the potential of every soul and what the Prophet ﷺ was referring to when he said people are mines they're like gold and silver mines they're valuable but just like to get that gold and that silver out of the ground out of the mine you gotta dig and you gotta work and you gotta be patient and you gotta put in work We'll, be have, we'll have to be patient and put in work. But we can uncover the gold and silver within every single human being. That's our mandate. That's our responsibility. That was a prophetic vision. That's what I learned how to do from this very humble, very simple, you know, interaction. But powerful, actual, actually, interaction that I had with a beautiful soul. And I just wanted to share that story in the premise of sharing personal stories. It really helped me become who I am. I promised the respected moderator and Dr. Altaf Hussein as well that I would conclude my session sooner rather than later as we're in preparation for the entertainment session and everything else inshallah that's about to go on. Uh, so Jazakumullah Khairan, thank you very much. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Jazakallah Khair for helping us to end this session on time. Let's have another round of applause for all of these incredible role models for their perseverance, for their courage, for their outreach. May Allah reward all of you. I'm going to conclude with the surah that mentions these type of people. Jazakumullah khair and shall we stay around to enjoy the entertainment session and the rest of tonight's program. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>